Welcome to Slate Church. We are so glad that you're tuning in today and pray that wherever you are, this message will bless you. If this impacts you in any way, we would love to hear about it. Send an email to mystory at slatechurch.com. Are you excited to be here? Are you expectant of what God could do over the next 40 minutes? Yeah? Uh, 40 minutes, or if you're not engaged, I might just go two hours. Who knows? I just, uh, right into the next service, they'll just join us. We'll just keep setting out chairs, and even though we don't have much space <laughs> to add anything else. But uh, I'm really excited to speak. I love speaking on finances. I think for those that come into the church and... Uh, and they uh, have a problem with church and the money, uh, and, and the money, <laughs> that's what we call it around here. We're talking about the money today. Uh, with, uh, they, have a, they have a hard time with church and money. Uh, I think that, that we need to actually speak about money as often as we can as a church because uh, nobody else is speaking about it in a healthy way. Nobody else is saying things like, I love Peter and Bethany's story in the video. Not only do they tithe to their local church, but they literally set aside another amount throughout the month just to give away. Listen, you can complain about church and money all you want, but the church is not only the ones giving the most to churches, they're also the ones giving the most to charities in Canada, and I think that the church needs to celebrate its view on money. I think it's a good thing that we can celebrate finances in our church. It's, it's actually something to be celebrated, and uh, we love to celebrate things around here. Josh, I want to celebrate you really quick. Josh Cox, he's on our muscle team. Uh, he's incredible. I, I don't know. I was just watching you worship, and I, I just want to say, like, you're incredible. You're doing a great job of what you do here. Josh serves uh, weekly. He's here. Even throughout exams, he even uh, uh, modified our, our teardown schedule of everything that you see. It gets set up and tear, torn down every week, and you modified it, and we cut the time in, what, no one, like an hour? And uh, it's just amazing what you're doing. Josh, you're incredible. We thank you for your involvement here. Thanks for everything you're doing. I'm really pumped. God has a, a message on my heart. You know, Jesus spoke a few thi- about a few things in the Bible quite frequently. On faith uh, in the Bible, we talk about it 500 times. In the Bible, you will find 500 different uh, instances where faith is being spoken about. You will find 500 different instances where prayer is spoken about in the Bible. But you will find... 2,000 different times where Jesus or the Bible speaks on money. That's alarming, and, and this isn't further proof that God is obsessed with money, but I think it's further proof that God knows that we're obsessed with money, and unless he speaks to it, we'll be lost without him. And so I'm really excited to speak on this topic, and uh, you know, the, the passage that we're going to find ourselves in today, and if you have your Bible, you're going to turn with me to John uh, chapter 6, and uh, the passage we're going to speak on today, it's interesting. We, uh, it's the only miracle in the Bible that is recorded in all four gospel accounts of Jesus. That's, no, just me? I'm the only one nerding out on, uh, whoa, <laughs> Jackie, whoa. It's actually significant because the synoptic gospels, which are the three earlier accounts of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they record a lot of the same stories. For whatever reason, John just does his own thing. That's why I'm so obsessed with John. John's telling about foot races. John's telling everybody about he, how he's the disciple that Jesus loved. He also just doesn't include stories. He's like, you know what? Those guys got it covered. I'm just going to tell my own story about some of the things Jesus did and some of the unique things I was around for. And John records this story along with the other three uh, writers of Jesus' life. And we're going to find ourselves in John Chapter 6, verse 1, if you're there, say, I'm there. Did anybody lie when you said that? I lie every single week. I'm like, I'm there. And I'm like, don't even have my Bible with me. I do. I always have my Bible with me. But I wait for it to come up on the screen, just like the rest of you. I'm, I'm human. I, I, I have the things I'm working on as well. All right. Let's, let's read this. John, chapter 6, verse 1, it says this. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee. It just says sometime after this. John isn't 
isn't wanting to get into the minors of this story. There's a miracle he wants to tell. He's not getting into the minors of the story because he has some strong majors that he wants to focus on. I think this is incredible for the local church to get a hold of, that we have a message that majors in salvation and minors in a lot of the things that we want to talk about, and it's time that we start majoring in salvation so we might see an entire world come to know him, an entire city come to know him, an entire neighborhood block that you live in come to know him. Our mission statement says it all. It says we exist to see those far from God come into relationship with him. You can define far from God however you want, but I know that amongst all the sinners in the world, I am a chief sinner. I I stand with God. I, I need his blood to cover my life because if it was up to me, I would mess it up time and time again. And so we need to focus on this major in our church. All right, here we are. It says he was on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. That is the Sea of Tiberias. Everybody say Tiberias. Tiberias. It's just fun to say. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. I I want want Slate to be like this. And people just come because they hear the signs of what's happening at Slate. People, lives are being transformed. Marriages are coming together. People are getting jobs left, right, and center. I want the signs of Slate to speak for themselves and people to come just because of what God's doing and not necessarily because what we're doing. It says they were coming because they knew the signs that he was performing. That Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. He already had in mind what he was going to do. He already had in mind what he was going to do. I think that's amazing. Philip answered him, it would take more than a half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will will they go among so many? Jesus said, I'll show you how far. (laughs) Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down, about 5,000 Men were there. Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all eaten enough, had enough to eat, he said to the disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over uh, by those who had eaten. Come on, let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for our time together. I thank you so much for what you're doing in this church. God, in our short months together, you have done so much. We have so much to be thankful for. And in this place, God, I pray that you would have your will be done. I pray that even though we are talking about money tonight, that people would understand it's not about money. It's about our hearts. It's about our relationship with you. And I pray, God, that you would reign in this place tonight. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Everybody said? I always love that because... The people that did say amen say it louder, and then the people that were like, oh, I was caught off guard by that, actually say it. And Cool? Just me. All right, if you're taking notes tonight, if you're taking notes tonight, uh, you can write down, down this title. And remember, note takers get into heaven quicker, don't they? They're in the express line at Disneyland getting on those rides quicker than you are. They're like, St. Pete's at the, at the gates, and he's just like, yo, where, where are your notes? And, uh, and he lets you buy if you've taken notes. No? It's not in my Bible either. <laughs> It's not in there, but for the sake of uh, for tonight, if you're taking notes, I want you to write down this title. Uh, The title of my message tonight is The Multiplication Table. This is a good title. I usually write down like so many different titles, and and I got it right the first time this time. The Multiplication Table. So many layers to this. It is so good. You know, things multiply in our lives all the time, don't they? They just multiply kids, they multiply. They have a couple of kids, they link up with some other kids when they're adults, and they, uh, and married, and uh, this is going on, uh, and they multiply, right? But uh, who knows that, that not only just kids multiply, uh, so does some of the work around your house, so, so does some of the responsibilities that you have in your life. I remember moving out of my house and, and immediately understanding that I had the responsibility to take care of my dorm. And I lived with a bunch of guys that didn't care that meat was rotting in our, in our uh, sink. And so, uh, I mean, me and my, my buddy, Justin Oltoff, 
Shout out Justin Oltoff if you're watching. I don't know if he watches. I'm assuming everybody in Canada watches these videos. And uh, <laughs> it's like somebody's like, this guy's so prideful. Like, I just heard about you today. Yeah, but now you're watching. You were the last person to find out. And uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding, of course. We would clean up the place. I mean, dirt was everywhere. We would clean it up. I remember moving into our first little apartment, Emma and I, and, and we began to realize that now there isn't. We lived with eight people in, uh, irrespectively at different times, and now it was just the two of us, and we realized, oh, goodness, we have the, we have the responsibility to clean up the dirt in this place. Like, it's our dirt, and we got we to gotta clean it up. Moved into another apartment, moved into a house, and, and with every size of building, we saw a correlation. The correlation was that the bigger the space, the more the dirt. Really simple, right? The more space we have, the more dirt that could accumulate, and so we just spent, we spent all of our time cleaning, it seems. And uh, so when we had kids, we expected, you know, well, there's two of us. We, we put out this much dirt. And uh, adding a child, they'll just add that much dirt to, uh, to our home life. And, and we'll just have to clean up after them. But who knows, uh, especially parents, <laughs> that kids don't add dirt. They multiply the dirt. They're like little miracle workers for the, for the dust bunny. You know, <laughs> like, I don't believe in the Easter bunny, but I, but I believe in the dirt bunny. And, uh. It just, like, it accumulates. It, it multiplies. I don't know what the, where these kids get this dirt, but they literally just carry it around with them and just, like, falls off of them. And uh, <laughs> it's not quite that bad, but, uh, but, but dirt, dirt's everywhere. I mean, you give them a meal, and I swear, they're like Jesus in this story. They multiply the meal all over your floor. And it's like, I, I only gave you an apple. Why is there pizza and pears and Apples on the floor, like, what happened? They, like, get those little juice packets, and they produce real fruit out of it, and it's everywhere, and, and it's just multiplied. Dirt is multiplied in our house, and we decided the other day, we, it's time that we clean the bathroom, because when you have small kids, sometimes you just, you, you don't get to certain parts of your, your house very often, and, and for us, just for a season, just for a season, I need to, I need to, like, just make this known. It was just for a season, because I think Emma was feeling a little, like, side swipe last last time I said like our house is such a mess it's not it, it was just, just a season our bathroom was clean Emma it does a great job and so do I because she doesn't clean it all and I'm just going to move on we're not uh, it's it's uh and 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 so the bathroom was dirt really dirty and so uh, you begin to realize it's dirty especially when your kids start potty training because you're like lying on the ground like can you go to the bathroom please and you're like that was that's there like that, that's disgusting and uh, I had to remove the stopper from the sink, and I mean, I almost threw up. It was disgusting. It's the one area of the house we didn't clean since we moved in two years ago. And so we're not just pulling out our gunk. Uh, we're pulling out the multiplied gunk of whoever lived in that place before us. And you pull out this stopper, and if you've done this, this is the grossest thing in the world. It's like, is that hair or is that a new kind of chemical? Like, I, I don't know what this is, and Emma's like, way better than I am at all of this stuff. I have a weak stomach, and she's in there with, a, with like, a screwdriver, and she's like, Brandon, it's not that bad. And I'm like, really? And I'm like, oh, oh. <laughs> just too much information. Dirt, gunk, it just multiplies. I find in my life, the longer I allow sin, the longer I allow bad decisions, the longer I allow conflict, unresolved conflict, just, just be, it doesn't just add. It doesn't, it doesn't just add to the stress of my life. It multiplies the gunk of my life. It multiplies what, what has happened in my life. I might, feel, I might feel just so at a loss for what to do with what's going on in my life, but it's not just like adding things. I just start feeling like I'm on a downward spiral. I, I find like I'm on a slippery spiral slope, I find that, 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 that the energy that I'm exuding is far more greater with each thing I add to that than it was before. Uh, the gunk in our life does not just add to the gunk in our life. It multiplies the gunk in our life. Who's thankful that we serve a Savior <laughs> that is not deterred by the multiplication of the dirt in our life, but He came to put an end to the dirt in our life. He came to pay a price for our lives. He came to pay a price that we couldn't pay for ourselves. While we were on the downward spiral, he reached into the miry clay and pulled us up to a place seated in heaven with him and called us his children. I'm so thankful that in a year, in a month, in a day, in a minute, in a moment, 
God can reverse all the things that we have done up until this place. This is the word that we get to share. This is the salvation that brings us here today. This is why we come to this place and we get excited about the city that we live in. Why we want God to do something great in this city. Because he first did it to us. I love that we're a church that you can come as you are. Because I really believe that as we come as we are and we don't try to get our lives together before we meet Jesus, all of a sudden we meet him and all of a sudden things start, they all of a sudden start accumulating in the, in the good direction, don't they? They start multiplying in the opposite direction. They start actually adding to what's happening rather than taking away. And God has his way. God is, Jesus is, is up on a hill in the story. And his disciples have just come back from preaching the gospel to the surrounding, the surrounding area. And I think that they came back with the idea that they'd be able to come back and actually just be able to sit with the Savior of the world that takes away the dirt of their souls, the dirt of their lives. And I think they're expecting this, but they come up to Jesus and Philip's right there. And, and rather than allowing Philip to just be and exist beside him on this mountainside, it says that Jesus says to Philip, look out, look at all the people, give them something to eat. Philip goes, what in the world? Like, there's like, there's not just 5,000 men here. I have, you know, the Bible was recorded in a time where, where women weren't counted in the attendance, attendance reports. It's, it's not the Bible. Jesus was one, actually, like, like, actually brought in the idea of equality. It is traced back to Jesus. And, and, but, but they record that only 5,000. They believe that about 15,000 people were there that day. Philip is there with Jesus, and Jesus is saying, you go Philip, feed them, Philip. And Philip's like, What? What do you mean? There's 15,000 people. Like, this is the size of the ACC. Like, the, well, what am I going to do? Like, like, the Raptors can't even seem to fill, every, you know, feed everybody. Unless they charge an a, a arm and a leg, right? They're like, what do you mean, Jesus? Feed the people that are here. See, Philip and the disciples wanted to spend time with the dirt remover. He wanted to spend time with the Savior of the world. They've been working hard. And I find so many times in our churches we find ourselves on the mountaintop just wanting to kick up our feet rather than recognize the need that actually exists in our world. So many of us come through valley seasons ourselves. So many people come through the valley and we're exhausted and we're tired and we're so thankful that we finally get out of the storms that we've been going through. And so we get up to a mountaintop experience and the focus shifts from being on ourselves and the pain that we're in to being on ourselves and just trying to kick up our feet to ignore what's actually happening in the world. You know, I want to tell you that if you are in a valley... David records in one of the Psalms, Psalm 23, says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You hear what he says? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You don't have to stay in the valley. You don't have to stay there because of the price that Jesus paid for your life. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, you don't have to remain in the valley. But notice those who follow God don't have the option of just focusing on their needs and then focusing on their rest when they get to the mountaintop. In fact, when you're in the valley, it's okay to focus on your needs. But when you get to the mountaintop, when you get over here, it's time to start looking out on the needs that are in front of you. It's time to start recognizing other, others' needs. It's time to recognize the position of strength you now have and the ability you have to now reach the people around you, the people that need you so desperately. You see, God will bring you up onto the mountain. To reveal the miracle he wants to perform for the masses. God will bring you up on the mountain to reveal to you the miracle that he wants to perform for the masses. We cannot afford, those of us that are in a mountaintop season, we cannot afford to just stay up on the mountain and think that for some reason we are so blessed to kick up our feet and ignore the needs around us. God is telling us, look out, see the need. Look, there is a city in need of my love. They're in need of being fed spiritually. Give them something to eat. I wonder if you're in this place and you're ready to give this city something to eat. I wonder if you're in this place and you're ready to give your workplace something to eat. I wonder if you're in this place and it's time to set, set up and start feeding your own family with the love of God. This city is in need of people that are willing to feed it with what God's only able to feed it. Philip looks out and he, and he sees the impossibility. He goes, I, 
I mean, we don't even have food for ourselves. We just came off the mission field. Like, what do you mean? I can't give food to this. It would take eight months wages to supply just a bite, just a timbit to those that are sitting here. So what do I have? Philip sees the impossibility of the situation. You know, in the impossible situations that we find ourselves in this place right now, we have a Savior that looks out and not just sees the possible, but sees it in reality, sees it fulfilled, sees the other side of the miracle, sees people fed, sees them able to walk well, sees them able to follow him. He sees beyond it. Jesus often proclaims what we don't see as if it already was. And I believe that he's already proclaiming over our church what we can't see over our city, what we can't see over our region, what we can't see over our province, what we can't see over our nation. I believe that he is already proclaiming that the year of the Lord is here. I believe that he's saying salvation is near, and I believe he wants to provide it. All we have to do is to step into it like the impossible is actually possible. In God, all things are possible. Turn to your neighbor and say, with God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. God has in mind what he's going to do, doesn't he? It says he asked Philip this, but it says, but God, Jesus already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip's like, what, what is going on? All he sees is impossible. <laughs> But God already had in mind what he was going to do. You, all you see in your life right now is the impossible. I believe that God already knows what he's going to do. I believe he already has a plan to get you out of the place that you find yourself. I believe he already has a plan to mobilize you from the mountain. I believe he already has a plan to get you through the valley. I believe he already has a plan to supply for your every need and every need of the people around you. God had in mind what he was going to do. So what I love about Jesus <laughs> He's not like the weather reporters that we have today. I live beside an old-time weather reporter. And so I love weather reporters, and he's new in this city, and, and that's fine. But uh, they don't get it right very often, do they? <laughs> they don't forecast very well. It's like, it's going to rain tomorrow, and it's like beautiful sunshine. It's going to be sunny tomorrow. It's just like rain. It's like, wait, like, this is the only job you can fail day after day and still keep your job 30 years later. And uh, <laughs> they don't forecast really well. But Jesus sees the forecast. He sees the forecast and he sees, you know what, this is not going to be the case. These people are going to get fed. And I don't know about you, but as soon as I saw the forecast of what the next two weeks are going to look like, I started already like pulling out my summer clothes. I started like getting all my summer stuff ready. Everybody was complaining about last weekend and I was looking forward to the forecast and I was like, you know what, I'm going to get my bicycle ready because I'm a cyclist in this city and if you drive in this city, the person that you want to hit because you can't get around them is actually me, so don't kill me, please. And, uh, and uh, so as a cyclist, I'm so excited. I'm like, okay, I got to get my bike ready. I'm pumping up the tires. I'm making sure that it's all ready. I took it in for a, my yearly tune-up. I'm like, get me my bike back. Like, I got to get ready for this next week. I'm on the, I'm on the, I'm texting back and forth with Chris Roush. Everybody know Chris Roush. He's amazing. Him and I, my wife didn't find out till last service, planning a trip down to the Florida Keys to go cycling. Like, I'm in summer mode, man. Because here's the thing. I don't want to just spend my summer watching cyclists. I don't want to spend my entire summer just watching cyclists drive by me while I'm in my car. I don't want to just sit in my home and go, wow, those cyclists are having a good time. I don't want to just look at cyclists. I want to actually cycle myself. I don't want to just look at what people are doing. I want to be a part of it myself. You see, I don't want to just witness a miracle. I want to be a part of the miracle that God is about to do as he's forecasted for the future. I want to be a part of what he's actually doing in this city. I want to be a part of what he's doing in reversing our ideas of Christianity. I want to be a part of that. So I don't want to just witness. I want to be a part of it. But some of us need to understand there is a preparation season that needs to happen in order to get to that place. I spoke on the preparation season last week, didn't I? We need to have budgets in this place. We need to get our finances in order. We need to give our first fruits to God on a weekly basis. We need to do all those things. But tithing is not giving, it's just returning. And God today is asking us to give towards what he is doing. You know, this isn't just a message on give to heart for the house. There's a lot for you if you're visiting. There's a lot for you. But I believe that God is asking us prepare to give. Prepare 
your hearts. Prepare for the miracle I'm going to do. I brought you to this mountain to see the miracle that I want to do for the masses. You know, it's at the place where our provision ends that God starts. It's at the place where our provision ends that God's provision starts. And this happens because none of us should have the provision to be able to get to the place that we need to go that God is calling us by our own means. God does this so he can develop a heart in us that says, if I don't have God on my side, I'm not going to get there. Because the moment that we calculate that we can get to the places that are on our hearts and on our minds and the miracles that we want to see done in our lives, the moment that we have enough to get there is the moment that we start turning our backs on God. This happens all the time in our society. I speak on it consistently because I think the burden and and the thing that is so, um, so prevalent in our society today is that we've been blinded by our prosperity. We live in a society blinded by prosperity. We don't think we need God because we have enough to actually do things on our own. And yet God is saying, I want to do a miracle, and the provision isn't there. Isn't it sound familiar? That the vision is there. The provision has not yet come. But I believe that the provision is coming. I believe the miracle is coming. I believe the multiplication is coming. I believe that God is going to do what God has set out to do. Where our provision ends, you should celebrate. Because that's the place that God begins to operate. When we begin to come to the place at the end of our own means, we have no other choice but to look at God, to get on our knees, to get into a private place and start praying to him, God, this will not succeed without you. And Andrew, one of Jesus' other's, other disciples, he comes and he has that same kind of heart, brings this little boy and he says, like, this is all we've got, <laughs> but how far will it go? How far could just two fish and five barley loaves actually go? Barley was the poor person's way of making bread. All the other people that had money in this society would not be eating barley bread. It's like pita bread today. That's, that's kind of what it's like. And he comes up, he's got five pitas and two dried out, likely pickled fish. <laughs> that's all he's got. And Andrew's going like, this is what we found but how far will it go? I don't know what you're planning on offering up today. I don't know what you plan on giving to God outside of just your money, but your time and your resources. But don't look at what you can give to God and ever look down on it like, how far will this go? I'll tell you how far it will go. It can be multiplied at the hands of the Savior. It can be used to do a miracle for the masses. And God can use whatever you're willing to release to Him as long as... You give it to him. And Andrew's going, how far will this go? I'm at the end of my own resources. I'm at the end of my own resources. But this little boy knew something about God. (laughs) He's a child, and for some reason it seems like certain children have an ability to give just so naturally. They just have an ability just to give. They they don't understand because they understand that they don't really own anything. Mom and dad will get it back for them if I just give it, you know. Mom and dad will give it back. And for some reason, we grow out of the heart of giving. And we need to grow back into the heart of giving in this place. We need to grow back into the heart of generosity. We need to grow back into the heart of God can do anything as long as I release to him what is rightfully his. My father can provide anything. My dad can give me anything back because he's the one that provided it in the first place. This little boy understood something about giving. He understood something about giving. He understood that you can never, you can never outgive God. You can't outgive God. His mother probably gave him this meal as as he was leaving the village that day to go see Jesus. This will feed you. This will sustain my son. And here he is giving it to Jesus because he recognized something. I can't outgive God. I can't outgive the creator. I might give him something made out of flour and barley, but I'm giving it to the person that created flour and barley. When I give to God, the creator of the universe can always outgive me. You realize that you will never come second by placing God first. 
You will never come second by placing God first. You will never come second by placing all that you have in the hands of Jesus. And this little boy, poor little boy, comes to Jesus and says, this is all that I have and I give it to you. My question is, where is the other people with their lunches? (laughs) Like the Bible tells us about the one boy that gives his lunch to God, and that's fine. But I read about 15,000 people that are present that also left their homes that day. And I just question, where are the other people with, with lunches of their own? Why weren't they giving it up to everything that's happening? Why aren't they putting it at the feet of Jesus? I think the same thoughts that go through their heads are probably, and the, the same thoughts that go through our heads were the same thoughts going through their heads. Well, how far will this go? I mean, I need to eat. If I give this up, there's no way that I can eat. If I give up my resources, there's no way that I'm going to have enough resources to live my own. If I give up my money, where is it going to come back in? If I give up this, what's going to happen? And the questioning is going on in their hearts. These are people that likely had some food themselves. 15,000 people. I have a hard time believing that 99.99% of them forgot their meal that day. Even if 90% of them forgot their meals, which is not, not like mind-boggling, mind-boggling, it would still leave 1,500 people with their lunches. And yet it's one little boy that comes to Jesus with his, with his lunch and offers it to him. See, I really believe that this boy that realized that you can't outgive God understood one thing, that the size of your sacrifice often reveals the significance of your salvation. The size of your sacrifice often reveals the significance of your salvation. Before you think that I'm using salvation as a way for people to give their money, your salvation stands alone. There is nothing you can do to buy your salvation. There's nothing you can do to to earn your salvation, to pay the price for your salvation. That is done in Jesus alone. But at the moment we were saved by him, that should motivate us to give back to God what is rightfully his. It should reshape our minds and our time and our resources and our treasure and give back to him. I'm thinking of the woman who came just before Jesus, just before Jesus died. He's he's reclining at the table, perhaps a multiplication table. He's he's reclining at the table, and she breaks a, a jar of perfume. And one of the disciples, he was a treasurer, he later sold out Jesus to the cross. He says, why didn't you sell that? All the money could have been given to the poor. But just a few chapters earlier, This story of this woman, you learn that Jesus actually raised her brother from the dead. I don't know about you, but if Jesus is able to raise my brother from the dead, if he's able to raise the dead things in my neighbor's life from the dead, if he's able to raise up the dead things in my life up uh, up from the grave, if he's able to bring those things up to life, I am willing to sacrifice a large percentage because I believe in salvation is quite significant to my life. What about the other time where Jesus, he's watching the offering plates being passed, right? The slate buckets are being passed, and Jesus is that slate, and he's just kind of watching. Now, we don't do this as pastors, <laughs> obviously, for obvious reasons. But he's just watching people give. And he's watching the buckets pass. And, and that guy over there, he gives $10,000 this week. Unfazed. That woman over there, she gives $1,000. That guy over there, he's just like, I haven't given in a while. He gives a million dollars. And all of a sudden, it's coming to the end. And, and there's this older woman right over here. Jesus is watching. He's, he's just kind of collecting, kind of unfazed. And all of a sudden... She puts two pennies in the offering. And his first thought is, where did you get those? I thought we stopped that. (laughs) But his second thought is, hold up. Everybody said, no, no, seriously, stop. Everybody stop. This woman over here, this woman right here has given more than anybody in this place. More than the person that gave 10,000, more than a thousand, more than a million. She gave more because she didn't give out of what she had. She gave all that she had. 
See, Jesus is speaking something here to us today. That the size of your sacrifice reveals the significance of your salvation and what it means to you. When you get a heart about what God has done for you, there is nothing you can do but say, Jesus, have it all. When you realize that that hose and, and that little, that little um, faucet, that it's been turned on by God, that the water's only running because it's his, I'm taking the water and I'm bringing it right back to him because I don't want you to turn off that faucet. I don't want to step outside of your blessing. I don't want to be outside of what you're doing. I want to be a part of the miracle. I see the miracle you want to do for the masses. I want to be a part of it. This boy gives everything he has to Jesus. You know, tonight... We're not looking for equal sacrifice, or equal giving. We're, we're looking for equal sacrifice. Let's celebrate those that give a lot. Because there's some of you in here, you're about to give a lot, and it's weighing on you. I'm going to celebrate it. For those of you that are like Daniela, I'm on OSAP. I have a part-time job. Or like Sarah, where she gives up eating out for a month just to give sacrificially. We're not looking for equal giving. We're looking for equal sacrifice. Jesus wasn't looking for equal giving. He was just looking for equal sacrifice. And I believe that there were people that missed out on the miracle he did for the masses because they weren't willing to be like this little boy and just give it all to him and watch what God could do when he multiplied it at the multiplication table. Everybody ate at the table that day because of one boy that was willing to release to God what was his. You know something? Only what is released to Jesus can be multiplied. You could have it all and have all the intentions in the world to change it for the better. But until you release your resources to God, until you release your time to God, until you release your talents to God, until you release your finances to God, it cannot be multiplied and it will do nothing for nobody but yourself. I wanna be on the side of the miracle for the masses. I don't wanna just momentarily have my hunger filled. And so God, So God, place a, we're praying to God this past week, getting ready for today, getting ready for what I believe is the miracle that he wants to do today. And Em and I are praying, and thankfully, we came together and we said, like, how much are we going to give? We want to give sacrificially today. How much are we going to give? And we looked at each other and we said the same amount, and I was like, oh, thank you. Come on, God. Thank you for speaking to our hearts the same amount. It was the exact same amount. <laughs> We're going, wow, this is sacrificial. This is, this is crazy. And during this time, I'm reading a, a book. It was called The Blessed Life by Robert Morris. It's fascinating. Anybody that critiques it hasn't read the whole thing, similar to the Bible. Anybody who critiques it hasn't read the whole thing. There's a lot of good stuff in both. I'm reading this book, and he's telling these stories about he, how he gave away um, nine cars in a year and a half. He just felt God tell him, like, give away your car, and gave away his car. And all of a sudden, the next day, somebody's coming and giving him a car, and he's going, like, I'm trying to get rid of cars. And he gives it to somebody else, and God gives him another car, and it just keeps happening. And it's like, what is, what is going on? He tells all these different stories about how one day he held up $100. He prayed to God, like, this is the last $100 I have. He's at a conference. He gives it. And uh, right after the conference is done and he gives it into that offering, a man comes up to him. He's like, I felt God tell me I needed to give an amount to somebody in the room. And uh, the only person with their hand up was you. I don't know why. And he's just going, I was just desperate. And he said, but God told me to give you this. And he opens it up, and it's a $10,000 check the moment he gave it away, and, and I'm wrestling with this. We're about to give sacrificially. I'm going, God, but does that exist in our country? Does the generosity exist to tithe, to give above and beyond, and to be generous to people around us? Like, is this a battle we're going to have to fight for 30 years until it becomes a norm in southern Ontario? Because I'm willing to do it if it, that's what it takes. I'm willing to give it all away so that it'll actually become a part of the culture of our church. I'm willing to see a need and meet it. I'm willing to be like Peter and designate some to other people. I want to give extravagantly. I said to God, I said, but is this what 
Does this, this actually exist? Like, if we give away, can we actually experience that? Like, I, I just don't see people randomly just giving away money, giving away cars, giving away stuff because God spoke to their hearts. They said, God, I just don't even see people listening for that. I said, God, I want to be somebody that listens like that. But do you even do that? And I mean, it's easy in Texas, I think. But can you do it here? During this time that we're wrestling with the sacrificial giving, Emma comes up to me after last Sunday, and she just says, hey, I feel like God's telling us to double that. And I'm going, well, now we're not on the same page. You know? <laughs> and I am wrestling even harder with this this past week. God, really? And I'm prepping for this message, and I'm praying through all this stuff, and I'm sitting in Starbucks, and all of a sudden, in all my wrestling, and all my confusion, and all of my questioning, Somebody walks up to the table that I'm sitting at and literally as quickly as this comes up, takes one of these, puts it on the corner, says, that's for you, and walks away. This has not happened in a very long time in my life. I have my own stories of stories that Robert Morris told. Literally people, but this person just came up in the midst of my wrestling, this is for you, and walks away. It's a $10 Starbucks gift card. It's not $10,000. It's not $100. It's not, it's a $10. But all of a sudden, God was saying, you worry about what you're going to give, and I'll worry about mobilizing generosity. You worry about what you're going to do, and I'll worry about providing what is needed for you and your family. You start doing what I've said, and I'll start doing what I said, because I'm the, I'm the father of multiplication. I'm the one that brings you up on the mountaintop. I'm the one that sees a miracle for the masses. You just give sacrificially. I'll take care of the rest. So today... We sat down with Theo and Kenzie, and Theo has no clue what's going on. Just learned to say dad, and he's going, dad, dad, dad. I'm like, quiet, son. I have something to tell you. I sit Kenzie on a chair, and she thinks she's in trouble. I have no clue why, but she's like looking around so sad. And we're like, Kenzie, it's okay. And Emma and I got down with our kids, an amount that was doubled from what we thought we were going to give in an envelope. We had Theo, we put it in his hand. He grabbed onto it, because he'll grab onto anything. We had Kenzie touch it. We both sat our kids and said, guys, this is a cost for our entire family. It's a sacrifice for all of us. God has done incredible things, and everything we have is from him anyway. This isn't just us giving. It's going to affect us all. But we really believe that God will provide for our needs, and we're going to do what God has placed on our hearts. And we prayed over that envelope, and we're excited to give it today. I don't know where you are today. If you don't call Slate Church home, feel no pressure to give. But my prayer is that you would take this card. Some of you prayed over it for the last three weeks. Some of you are, have missed the last two weeks and you're just hearing about this now. But maybe God's speaking to you. We'd encourage you, fill one of these out. We're about to do something significant. Because our provision will always come short of our vision here. But God is about to provide for the vision that he's placed on our church. Pray for this. In just a second, I'm going to pray. And if you need to give by debit tonight, sacrificially above and beyond what your regular giving, there's debit machines at the back. There's other ways to give. I believe we can put them on the screen. Just mark what, it, however you give tonight, just mark it heart for the house. I want to pray over this today because I believe that God is about to do something new. If you're in this place, could you just grab this and lift it up? Thank you for watching. Again, if you were impacted by this message in any way, send an email to mystory@slatechurch.com. You can also visit slatechurch.com and fill out one of our online connect cards. We would love to see you in person at one of our Sunday services. As well, you can stay connected with us by following us at Slate Church on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.